Thank you for coming out today during this wonderful Renewgler Week. To get you Both part of this fall's lineup at the NYU Skirball Center for the Performing Arts. The Heidi Latsky Dance and Palabolis are here to perform for you today. And to start us off, we have uh, two performers from Palabolis who are doing an excerpt from their show Shadowland. Palabolis will be performing the, the full event, uh, the full North American premiere of the full event for three weeks from November 20th to December 6th. And they are actually going to perform it twice today be because they want you all to sit in the center section for the beginning so they can see the sh you can see the shadows. And then um, we're going to shift everybody to the sides so you can then see how they do it behind the scenes. And they'll do, it, do the whole thing again. It's only uh, a few minutes. So it's not, uh, not going to be doing a great long performance for you twice. It is great, though. Um, so yes, please welcome Heather and Nate.
All right, now everybody move to the sides and you'll get to see this from a completely different angle, which I think is really interesting. All right. Next up, in honor of the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Heidi Latsky Dance will perform an evening of dance featuring diverse, unconventional performers on Sunday, November 15th. Now, please welcome Alexandria, Saki, Jillian, Jerome, and Meredith.
Another round of applause, yay! All right. So, both of your dance troops are part of the NYU Skirball Center for the Performing Arts. Um, they're, you're the season for 2015 here. Um, so, the Center for the Performing Arts is a premier venue in, for the presentation of cultural performing arts events down in New York, New York University in Lower Manhattan. 
Um, so the Skirball mission is to showcase and support diverse and eclectic talent from around the world, which both of you guys uh, and your dance troops obviously do. Um, and it cultivates audiences for live performance through deeper engagement opportunities. So the Skirball lineup has theater, film, dance, and dialogue. Like, how did how did your troops? First of all, you two introduce yourselves, but then tell us how your how your various troops became involved with uh, with the Skirball Center. Yeah. I'm Heidi Latsky. Um, I've been talking to Michael Harrington, who's a producer there, and we were going to do something this season. And then he actually wanted to push the company back a year, so we were going to do it next season. And I called him up and I said, you know, it's the 25th anniversary of the ADA, so 2015 would be such a good year to celebrate um, diversity and inclusion. ADA is the Americans. The Americans with Disabilities Act, which you you talked about yeah. before, yeah. Um, and so he. What's bit, what's interesting is there's a beautiful dance company out west called Axis, and uh, they've been around a really long time doing physically integrated work. And so he put the two companies together for this program. So I think it's really remarkable, actually. Hi, I'm Itamar Kabovi. I'm the executive producer of Palabolus. Um, and our relationship with Skirball really had to do uh, initially with looking to bring this show Shadowland to New York and wanting to find a perfect place to do it, which we did. And uh, Michael and the rest of the team at Skirball and we got together uh, about six, eight months ago and talked about what we might do and decided that this was the right way to bring the show into New York. It's been performing for the last chunk of time in Europe and in Asia, and has never been done in North America before. So it's uh, it's super exciting for us to bring the show home after having it seen by so many people that aren't our same sort of home home audience. So, so was it developed here or was it developed overseas? Shadowland? Shadowland was developed here. It had a sort of funny beginning. Uh, we were asked to make a commercial, a television commercial for a Hyundai car. And the request came in uh, that said, uh, could you guys make a car commercial with no car in it? And uh, <laughs> we thought, OK, well, we'll try to put a light behind a shower curtain and see what happens. And it turned out that we were able to create a convincing sort of transformation of this car in this commercial. And then we got a call from the Oscars shortly after that saying, could you do the same for the movies that were nominated this year? And suddenly we realized that this weird advertising inquiry turned into an enormously intense creative project. And How far along ago was this? This was about six years ago, the first commercial. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was the time that we sort of rediscovered this kind of modern form of shadow theater, which of course has existed forever. But this was a way of combining sort of full bodies and this kind of mixture of graphic and very plastic work, where you're seeing the bodies, but you're also seeing the images that these bodies can merge to create. And um, it really, it's like that very rare moment where you stumble into something and you go, wait a minute, this is not just a piece. This is not just an idea. It's actually sort of a form that you can work in for a long time. And so it doesn't happen very often that you bump into something like that. And it's been very exciting to work in. So is this is this kind of something that has just fallen in your lap, as you said, but taken you sort of to a new level of recognition? Because performing on, what well, you said, the Oscars, right? And you've done uh, collaboration with Penn and Teller, I believe, and and some other people. Um, so it, is this sort of breathed a new life into the program, or is this something like? I yes. Guess my, yes. The answer is yes. My question is, how does this compare to your traditional dance theater that you've always been doing ongoing? You know, it's interesting because in some sense it's completely different because it's obviously making shadows behind a screen and doing some of the stuff that you saw. Mm -hmm. But in other ways, the company for 44 years has been committed to sort of mixing bodies together and move from inanimate to animate type objects that are sort of merged and separated. Uh, so you see something that looks suddenly like a creature that exists that's made out of five people, and then they all come apart, and now you see each individuated form as a human being. And so in some sense, the big theme, the big idea, has stayed consistent all along, but the manifestation or the application of the idea to mm -hmm. a medium or a form 
that's brand new and certainly has been accessible to a brand new audience around the world in a way that, you know, that modern dance isn't always hmm. necessarily accessible to as broad an audience. So it's brought a lot of new people to see us in that. Right. So uh, Heidi, you and, and, and your wonderful dancers as well, um, so there, you guys are still more of the traditional, I say traditional modern dance, but yet you've incorporated, obviously there was Alexandria at the end who is deaf, we have a dancer who is deaf, and then we, other people in your troupe have disabilities. How have you, I guess, is that bringing the future into the present, or would you call that bringing the past into the present? That's a hard question. Um, we were just talking about this, that I would say we're very non-traditional, even in the traditional mode, like what you're yeah. talking about. Um, and, and actually, we've been exploring less traditional ways of, of opening this company to the public. Like, we're doing these movement installations, and one of which we're going to do at Skirball. We just did one in the atrium at Lincoln Center. Um, We've also, I made a film last year. I was commissioned by Montclair State University. And so we're trying to expand out because in our case, anyway, that's our, initiate, our initiative. Mm -hmm. Because we are a non-traditional cast and our mission is to redefine beauty and virtuosity and also dance, um, we just keep trying to find those venues to promote the work that we're doing. Because oftentimes, especially in the dance world, you tell people you have a mixed, uh, an integrated cast, or some people with disabilities, non-traditional, unconventional dancers, and they mm. shy away from it. Really? Yes. When you say? Yeah, it's, it's, it's um. So, so what are the critics? I mean, there are, are you well, getting... there's the, just some, if you tell somebody you're a physically integrated company, and most people call it mixed ability company, which we can't stand because it kind of, it infers that there are different abilities, which we know that's not true. Um, but normally people would associate a company like this with people who are wheelchair users. Mm -hmm. That's an automatic assumption, which as you can see, that's not the case. Not that we don't work with wheelchair users, we do, but it's not always the case. You were going to say something. Oh, I don't remember what I was going to say. Off. No, no, I, I, uh, we're here to hear you talk. It, uh, but it, it, I will say it's been a great year for us because we have been, um, we have these presenters now, like Skirball, like Michael mm -hmm. Harrington inviting us to do Skirball or being at Montclair State or, or at the American Dance Festival, which are more traditional venues. And so it feels like we're breaking through. Huh. OK, so I want to actually get over here to the dancers and let some of, of you folks talk. Would you mind um, going down the line and introducing yourselves as well? Uh, I'm Nate. I'm Heather Favretto. Jeron Herman. Hi, I'm Alexandria Wales. I'm Jillian Hollis. Meredith Fages. Saki Masuda. I'm Jimena Borges, and I'm the composer for Heidi Latsky's piece. So, and music director. <laughs> and music director, yes. So the, the collaborative process, I mean, I want to talk about the collaboration between um, the dancers and, and the executive directors and the choreographers. When you guys are coming up with new material, especially um, the both of you have such a unique, I guess, I, a set of skills is not what I want to what I want to say. It's like your the shadow theater is so unique, and having individuals with living with disabilities is is unique in itself. That you've like got a, a a very popular dance troupe. So when it comes to the collaboration, coming up with new pieces, do both of you sort of start with an idea and fit it to the dancers, or work with the dancers and fit it to the idea? Um, I think when people make things, they my, my experience has been we collaborate with a lot of people in diverse disciplines that aren't dance. We worked a lot with MIT uh, in their robotics department, and we worked a lot with puppeteers and magicians. We did a piece with Penn & Teller recently. Um, and what you realize by seeing how all people from all sorts of disciplines create, you realize that whether they're engineers or whether they're dancers, the process of making something is reasonably similar across the board. And it has to do with a process that's iterative 
and that you sort of start with where you know and you keep chipping away at what you don't know until you've realized that you've gotten somewhere. So in a way, we're constantly working both of those ends mm -hmm. of that question. You can't tell a story that you can't make interesting images for on, in shadow. You can't do that. And at the same time, you don't know what images to make until you've got a story in mind and so, or an idea in mind. And so we're always telling each other the same story over and over and over again as we chip it forward until we finally have something that starts making sense to everybody. I don't know if that explains it, but it really does go from both directions. In an artistic way, yes, I think it perfectly explains it. <laughs> um, in my case, uh, Norm, when I started my company in 2001, I was the material. So that, that all the material, all the choreography started from my body, and sometimes it still does. And actually, in somewhere, we did take a phrase of mine. But when I started in 2006 working with people with disabilities, it became clear to me that that was just not going to work. And it wasn't even interesting to go that way. And so even though the material might start with my body, it always evolved with every dancer I've worked with. And, and my interest has always been in seeing where they take it and then making it better because it's somebody else's um, interpretation. My, my process really changed a lot in 2006 because mm -hmm. I couldn't do that anymore. And then I stopped. I'm just not interested in that anymore, uh, to be honest. So sometimes, in, in somewhere, we used a, a phrase of mine. Um, but then it just went all over the place. And I do want to talk about the score because this was a really intense collaboration between me and Hamena. And I actually think you should talk about it. You okay with that? Oh, here. Um, well, this piece had a different score, which is what made it even harder, uh, because we were starting with a piece that had already been created for a different music, and everybody, the dancers, were used to the different music, so already starting to change that was very difficult to adjust for everyone, <laughs> right? Um, and also because the mood that Heidi wanted to create was so opposite what the other score was. The other score was uh, about eight or ten versions of the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Right? You can't, that's quite the task, right? Taking Somewhere Over the Rainbow and then creating something. And then totally also different. I compose music with only my voice and Heidi kept it kept wanting for it to not sound like anything. So anything that I did that was percussive, that was like she's like, it sounds like you're saying this or you're saying that. So I was totally stuck because I'm like, well, it's my voice, so it's always going to sound like I'm saying something. Um, so I had to transform my voice with effects to such degree where you couldn't recognize it, except for maybe one part where you recognize me saying ha ha ha. Um, oh, so what we just heard was all coming out of your throat? Yes. Wow. Right? Yeah, right? <laughs> Can you do it again? <laughs> Can you do it again? Yeah. I can't do it all at the same time. Okay. Uh, there's a, a million layers in there. But um, so the process was very difficult because we were all so used to this other score. And it just took a long time for all of us to get used to it because we realized that even if the music on its own worked, if the dancers weren't really comfortable with it and settled into this new music and into this new uh, feel for the piece, the music didn't work. So it had to come from both sides, where the music had to be something and then the dancers had to be part of that too, so that together it would be what Heidi wanted it to be. Huh. So um, how many of you guys, are any of you guys dancers, are dancers for these troops full time or do you all have, yes? Yeah? You're full time? Okay. So um, for the Palabas, Nate and, and Heather, you guys have traveled all over the world with the show, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, what is that, what kind of life is that like? Do you guys enjoy this? Do you go at home at the end of the day, you're like, I love my shadow performing, it's so great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, we have the best job in the world. Um, no, we've we've spent a lot of time in Germany and in Europe, and we've been lucky enough to. We had a great tour in Australia last summer, and been down to Brazil and Chile, and 
it's really cool to see how audiences respond to this work everywhere. And mm -hmm. some places have the, the audience is filled with children. In some places it's mostly adults. And um, and just the way that you can, you know, the way that we can animate ourselves to be larger than life in shadow and how impactful that is and how people can relate to this weird animal girl character. Uh, how long have you been doing the animal? Uh, three and a half years. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's cool. It's it's great. I mean, we miss our families, but we've kind of like created a family right. on the road. So Christmases yeah. together, Thanksgivings, you know. So how big is the is the whole troupe? Uh, the cast is nine dancers, um, and when we go on a long tour, we travel with twelve. Um, and uniquely, all of us know two or three roles, so we rotate. Mm -hmm. So pe if, in case people get injured or mm -hmm. uh, you know. Since we're traveling, people want to like a day off to see Munich or you know London or wherever we are. So it works out really cool that way. Oh, that's neat. So for the rest of you, um, yeah. So the rest of you haven't introduced yourselves yet. Come on, let's hear it. Um, so I've been dancing with Heidi since 2002, a year after the company started. So a very long time, yep. and I've been able to see the company grow um, and expand, and to where it is now is kind of amazing. Um, and we've had like a really great year of steady work. Um, but myself, like we all, most of us dance for other groups, but this is probably, this is my priority. Um, but I do like cabaret life and um, I do, I'm a Pilates teacher. So I'm full time committed to Heidi and we, we rehearse three times a week, right? When we are in session, I guess, when we have something that we're working towards, um, but. How often does that happen? Do you go into rehearsals every, like on a set schedule, every couple months? We have a set schedule, so usually we have like a time frame, Monday, mm -hmm. Wednesday, Friday, that we are committed to. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so we actually have, uh, we have two microphones in the aisles, if any of you have questions for anybody up here. Um, so to Alexandria specifically here, uh, yes. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. Can the microphone? Um, do you? I guess what made you decide to want to start dancing in the first place? Really, I started dancing. I was around two. It was just me and my lifeblood growing up. I went to college, University of the Arts. I have a bachelor's degree in dance. And then after college, I was trying to find myself. And then I got more involved with acting and really immersed in acting and on Broadway and TV and film. Uh, but dance was always in my soul and something I really wanted to pursue, but I didn't have as many opportunities until I met Heidi and I started working with them in 2013. And I was one of the new members at that time. I was really enjoying being involved with that company. The constant exploration of stillness at the same time exploring virtuosity and whatever that might mean but I'm always feeling that I'm being challenged in the best sense possible. You see something and Heidi really pushes us to keep going and explore that even further. So that's something I really enjoy, that stimulation. And when I'm not dancing and when I'm not in a show or if I'm not rehearsing, I'm actually a museum educator and I work for four different museums here around the city. And doing freelance. How, what's she doing now? And, and so what else are you doing now? You're an understudy, correct? Yes, yeah, so I'm actually involved with as the associate choreographer for, for the Broadway show Spring Awakening that's on Broadway right now. And I'm also an understudy for Marley Mallon in that performance. <laughs> um, yeah, so what are, what are the biggest challenges for you when learning a new piece? If you can't like, hear the music like, like the rest of the cast, how do, you, how do you keep the time and what cues do you use? Well, with rehearsal, you know, that's what yeah. rehearsals are for. <laughs> Generally, it's not just for learning the movements. You have muscle memory that can really help with that. And I think that musicality, anyone has musicality. We all have that. It really to, you know, de depends on how much musicality one might have is regardless of whether or not you're deaf or hearing. I have a lot of he hearing friends who can't move, who can't dance, who can't sing. And I'm thinking, <laughs> gee, you know, you, <laughs> 
you know, you're hearing, you must automatically be able to do certain things and that rely on your hearing, which isn't really true. And so in terms of music, you know, it's very strong vibrations, frequency, you can feel these elements in the environment. And I think I just happen to be maybe more aware on a whole body level there are some notes that are higher. I might not necessarily be able to feel them, but I rely on visual cues as well. I memorize the pieces. I memorize the movements, so I know it's my turn. I am attuned to the lighting, how that lighting changes, and that's also a cue, and the other dances around me, and rehearsal. I mean, really, that's a strong element of yeah. it. As any, It's part of that process for any of us. Yeah, that's amazing. A question over here? and attest to your comment. As much as I enjoy music, I'm zero talent in singing. So <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. But I have a question for the, um, our performers with disability. Like This is going to be a very googly question. We have a lot of conversation about, for example, women at tech. Since they're minorities, how are they going to evolve? How are they going to lead? How are they going to overcome the problems for other women to come up? So you as professional performers, do you feel that you have that obligation to not only bring yourself up, but also pave the way for other talented performers such as yourself to have a chance to be able to show what they have and what they can bring? Like the beautiful pieces you guys performed, I've never seen anything like that, and I'm a better person just seeing that. So do you feel that obligation, or do you feel just you have to focus on being a success story and then everything else falls in place? I think I have a response, um, because I was, uh, invited to dance. Um, it was, uh, I came to the city to be, um, you know, to write the next great American musical, um, which is still going to happen. No, uh, but I, um, <laughs> I hadn't thought of dance. It wasn't on my radar. Um, and so when I was asked to, uh, when I was invited to meet Heidi um, from another choreographer and just the kind of serendipitous path that I w was on, um, I saw an opportunity that um, wasn't first given to me. I think a lot of my uh, creative outlet was because it was in, in the vanguard for me to dance or for me to be a, a, physical, a, a visible performer. Um, so I relegated myself to the background. Um, however, now I do feel a great sense of, well, pride first and ability first, and then um, a sense of, of, of obligation. Um, my goal now is to is for my type to be saturated in the airwaves and the uh, the, the atmosphere because um, it's it's so underdeveloped or underrepresented. So I do feel that since and as a person of color too, I think there's like this compounded view of that um, because I um, I know that there aren't a lot of um, African American people with disabilities on TV as well. You know, so there's like this other thing. But that is all to say that I find the company to be um, a great playground for all of my questions. I grew up not really in my community. And so um, it's really great that I'm now in the disability community and, and taking a really active role because it is part of me. Hmm. And I also, I don't think that it's an obligation per se, not even a duty necessarily, but I just still feel it's part of the journey I do feel that it is important to prove that not only to yourself, but also to society and increase the visibility and encourage opening the door for other people. People, there is definitely a lot of talent that's not being recognized and being encouraged. It's not just one person who's obligated. It does take everyone to be involved. So I feel like all of these people here, when people witness and watch our show, they're seeing both disability and non-disability people, disabled people working together. And there's a bigger vision here. And that really shows what's possible. Flexibility, a lot of people sometimes are not sure what to do with you, what to do with me, they'll think as a disabled person. But there's just so many different ways to make it work and it's not that big of a deal. So you just have to honor what needs to happen as being part of the process, but other than that, you just go with it. And I've noticed that has been really powerful. People will respond to that process, the visibility. And I agree with what Jaron is saying in terms of artists of color as well, to increase that visibility. So, you know, and as a woman as well, so there's sort of a triple whammy there. <laughs> so yes, you know, 
we do feel sometimes, you know, like we want to just sort of why bother, you know, and give up and throw our arms up in the air sometimes because it can be really frustrating. But to recognize that we are making strides and increasing visibility and it's a moment by moment change. Like Heidi said, for the company, it's been a great year. And also for me, too, it's been an excellent year. I've just been very, very busy as an artist. Um, you know, I've gone through some long dry spells of lots of auditions and not having very much going on for myself. So we just have to kind of roll with it. That's part of the business in general, and that's applicable to anyone. Hmm. So how, do, how would you recommend that, that we spread the word? I mean, do you have educational opportunities? Do you have volunteer opportunities? How do we get involved? How do we let other people know? Specific. Well, like if it, well, here, if, Sorry. if I wanted to get involved and help uh, raise awareness for either of your troops, or do you have classes that you teach when people want to get involved in dancing, when they want to, if someone may have disabilities and they don't know where to start, where do they go? Um, you, uh, I don't teach on a regular basis, although we are starting, um, the, the DOE is very interested now in getting us into the schools, especially the public summit. schools. Public schools, yeah. yeah. So Jerron is teaching there right now, actually, in one school. And we're working on a whole workshop uh, to maybe be an annual thing or mm -hmm. like just to get this work into the schools, which I think is desperately needed. Um, you know, we, we have a website. People can contact us at any time. Um, we don't have a school. But we're, we're always in rehearsal. And we're actually always looking for performers and for people to support our movement, because mm -hmm. I do feel like it's a movement. You know, when you're asking the people with disabilities, I feel like this company and me, uh, specifically since 2006, I've become more and more of an advocate. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily an advocate for disability, um, but it's really for the, we coin it, the beauty of difference, right? The beauty of the individual. Mm -hmm. And that's really become very important to us all. So. We encourage people, we welcome people to become part of the process, support us in this mission. Mm -hmm. As a Palabalist, you guys have, you guys teach workshops, right? We teach quite a bit, yeah. And I think we, we actually have a program on the road when, as we tour and in Connecticut where our studio is in, during the summers um, where we essentially look for non-dancers and put them together with dancers in a creative process mm -hmm. workshop. Uh, and we work with multi-generational groups and people who have very little um, sort of ability to do acrobatics, but then have a huge ability to do all sorts of other things that mix together with difference mm -hmm. allows for great things to happen. So we do that in the summer and all the information there is also on our website. And the Ford Foundation has been supporting us over the last couple of years to bring those that programming to different cities where we're going to perform. And around the country in the US, we show up a week early and then reach out to a whole bunch of different groups hmm. and sort of introduce them to give them a sort of a, a, an immersive sense in what it is that we that we do and how we do it. That was great. Yeah. Question, Question over here. Yeah. Um, well, that was really fascinating. I actually, I didn't read the fine print of the announcement, and so I didn't realize until you got up here that it was a troop of with disabilities. So that was a really interesting sort of experience. And I guess um, I also, uh, my wife is deaf. I know a tiny, tiny bit of sign language. Um, not very good about that. Um, but I did pick up some of that, and I was curious what was being said there in the performance. So I'm talking to Garrett, and I was wondering if he understood what I was saying. And I was actually signing the lyrics to Somewhere Over the Rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but actually understand that the process was that when Heidi and I collaborate and we were discussing it, she asked me to do an ASL translation of the song. And then I went back to the beginning of the lyrics and I was creating an accumulation of the vocabulary. So this is first and then second and then third. And so we're sort of accumulating the vocabulary and then I was just turning up the speed. So from the beginning, to the very end, I was signing the lyrics of the song 
and I was incorporating the movement as well. Okay, good. I don't feel bad about not recognizing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. Yeah. Another reason that you probably didn't get it is that I took her face away, and would I may and, and I didn't know that. So the first rehearsal when I said, "So Alexandria, can you sign it? Just be neutral in your face," and that's like taking a whole chunk of the language out of the language, right? Which I didn't realize until that experience, but it was, but I I didn't want this section of dancing to just be her signing. I I really wanted it to be a lot more internal and evocative, and um, but I know that now I know how challenging that was for Alexandria. <laughs> hmm. yeah. Wow. That's wonderful. So we're actually running short on time here. So I, I want to thank you guys again for coming out and, and give the final plug here. The Skirball Center is located at the base of NYU's Kimmel Center for University Life, the main entrance at 566 LaGuardia Place, New York, New York, nyuskirball.org. For more info, HeidiLatskyDance.com. You will be there November 15th. Palabalist.org. You will be there November 20th through December 6th. Everybody, thank you so much for coming out. This thank you wonderful. so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.